Let's revisit a situation from the last chapter. We're given some data points and we want to find a function that represents them somehow. Now the answer in the last chapter was to use interpolation. There we said the function has to go through every data point. For some fairly complicated reasons, that's not always a good choice. That's especially true as the number of points grows, unless you're able to really control where those t values are. In machine learning, sometimes this is called overfitting. So we're going to pick a similar approach. We're still going to start with a function that's a polynomial, but now it's going to have degree n minus 1 rather than degree m minus 1, as we had before. The c1 and c2 and so on are unknown coefficients. They're to be determined by the data. So we're going to say that the function at ti should approximate yi for all the different values of i. But we're going to choose n to be smaller than m, and if that's the case, we can't expect to make this an equality in every case. The reason is that then we would have m conditions on n variables. And if m is greater than n, that's not possible in general. We need some other criterion to determine the coefficients. And the most common choice is to use the sum of squares. So let's take the difference between f and the data value as the misfit at one of the points. And then we will square those and add them up over all the points. And we'll call that the total misfit. In machine learning, this would be called the loss. So since this is a sum of squares of errors, then minimizing it is what we call least squares. We minimize this total misfit over all choices of the coefficients in the polynomial. Now to write this in more familiar terms, we can write this misfit as the two norm squared of a vector. That vector being the difference between f at ti and the data value at i. And if we do as we did with interpolation, think of these as linear combinations of the various powers of t, then we can write this residual vector using a matrix where the columns use different powers and the rows use different values of t. And we can put the coefficients into a vector and put the data values into their own vector. So we could call this a matrix capital V. It's m by n. It has more rows than columns. The vector of coefficients we can call c. The vector of data we'll call y. And then our residual vector is just v times c minus y. Notice that v has the same structure as a van der Maan matrix, but it's not square. It has more rows than columns. So now we can restate the least squares problem in a more linear algebra friendly way. We simply want to minimize over all n vectors c the two norm of v times c minus y. It doesn't matter whether we minimize the two norm or the two norm squared, we get the same c. So here v and y are given to us and we have to find c. Just a little bit of jargon. Technically, when we say min, it means the minimum value of the misfit. We're really more interested in the C that does it, and the proper way of writing that is to say argmin. But if you write min, most of the time people understand what you mean. Here we have some data. It's the worldwide difference in temperature from historical averages over part of the 20th century. So if we take a look at that, here are the data points that we're talking about. The matrices that we're going to be using have 
much smaller condition numbers if we choose our time variable not to be the year, but in terms of the number of decades since 1950. So with that definition, we have our vector of t values, we have our vector of y values. There are 10 points in each. And so we can construct a Vandermann matrix. Here, the first column is t to the zero power. And then after that, we build up the rest of the columns by taking t times the previous column. So what we end up with is a square 10 by 10 matrix. The columns correspond to the different powers of t, and the rows correspond to the different observations or the different data points. So I have a linear system of equations v times c equals y for the coefficient c in our interpolating polynomial. And we can solve for those coefficients using backslash. So you have the constant term, the first order term, and so on up to the ninth order. I'm sorry, the ninth degree term. And then with those coefficients, um, I'm going to use MATLAB's polyval function uh, to evaluate polynomial interpolant. It expects the coefficients to be given from high degree to low, so I have to flip the coefficient vector upside down. The time variable now has to be measured as decades since 1950. So f now is a function that evaluates the interpolant, and I'm just going to plot that over the same time period on top of the data. As you can see, it does interpolate all the values. However, it has some pretty undesirable behaviors in between the variables. This is going to manifest itself whenever you have uh, the degree of the interpolating polynomial increasing past, say, 3 or 4, and you have no control over where the t-values are, such as having them equally spaced like this. In machine learning, this phenomenon is called overfitting. If you try too hard to go through all the points, then the function ends up oscillating wildly in between. All right, so we want to do something other than this interpolation. So first of all, let's talk about fitting to a linear polynomial. So in that case, I just need a v which has two columns, t to the 0 and t to the 1. Let me give that its own section here. So when I do that, v now is a 10 by 2 matrix. So it's got more rows than columns. So now I have a linear least squares problem where I want to minimize the difference between v times c and the same y vector as before. Well, it turns out that the syntax for doing that in MATLAB is exactly the same as it is for a square matrix, for a linear system of equations. We use v backslash y to solve for v times c minus y being minimized. Now there are just two coefficients. This is the constant term, and this is the coefficient of the linear term in the approximating straight line. So the rest of the curve here, or the rest of the code here, is the same for creating the function that evaluates the fit. And you can see that this is our straight line fit. This is the same result as you would get doing it using the usual statistical procedures. But now we can extend it past a straight line fit by adding more columns to our matrix V. So now if I add t squared and t cubed, then our fitting function is going to be a cubic polynomial. So it has four coefficients, which we found by solving the least squares problem. And then we can plot that fit, the cubic fit, with the others. And you can see now that it stays closer to the data than the linear fit because it has more functions to choose from, essentially. But it doesn't do the wild oscillation swings that you see for the interpolation polynomial. So often, this sort of compromise fit is used for data from the real world. Now, before we get into the least squares problem more generally, I want to mention one more thing about fitting. One of the important things about our setup is that the functions that we're looking at have linear dependence on these unknown coefficients. That's critical 
for being able to use linear least squares as the solution strategy. But not every example we want to do has that property. So for instance, we might want to find an exponential fit to data. Well, if we do that, then if we take the log of f, we can see that we get a linear function of time. And so now we've converted it to a linear least squares fit. So if we take the log of the data and fit it to a straight line, then we can recover the coefficients in the exponential fit. Another common example is a power law dependence. In the power law, if we take the log of f, then we get a linear function of log t. So if you call that a new variable s, it's a linear function of s. So you fit the points where we take the log of both t and y and find a straight line for that. And then that tells us how to recover a1 and a2. So here's an interesting fact about pi. And we can use this to come up with approximations to pi as a whole sequence of approximations just by taking partial sums out of this series. So if sk is the partial sum of the first k terms, then we can multiply by 6 and take the square root, and we get pk, which is an approximation to pi. So here I'm going to do that for an index k going from 1 to 100. I use cumsum to do cumulative summations so that I get all the partial sums with one command. And then I'll get the p from there and plot the result. So as expected, this seems to be converging to pi. But is it really converging to anything, or is it just growing very slowly? It's a little hard to tell. It's often easier to tell by looking at the difference between the sequence and its limit. So in this case, the difference between p and pi. If I plot that, now we can see it appears to be going to zero. It's not very clear at what rate. Um, and I could fit something to this. I could fit cubic, let's say, to this data, but it's not quite clear what that would be telling me. Sometimes it helps to look at different views of the data, especially by taking logs of one or both axes. So in this case, if I just take the log of both axes on the same data, we get virtually a straight line, especially as k grows. And so that's a very strong hint when it's log log on both axes. That's a very strong hint that it's a power law. So we can use least squares fitting to come up with the coefficients of the power law. So if we assume a power law a times k to the b, then when we take the log of both sides, um, we would get a straight line. So if I take the log of the data, call that the y variable. If I take the log of the index and call that my t variable, then I'm just doing a usual straight line least squares fit using uh, y versus t. And so I can do that by setting up my Vandermond like matrix with two columns and solving a least squares problem. So there's the coefficients in the log variables. If I want to convert that back to the parameters for the original variables, then I just have to use the fact that the slope is b and the intercept is log a, so I can recover a and b. And you can see that this slope b is quite close to 1, so it would be pretty natural in this case to conjecture that the actual mathematical power in the power law might be negative 1. Uh, particularly if I go out farther in k, we could probably observe that to be even closer. But for what I did do, fitting all this data, here's the straight line fit, and you can see it's really excellent.